Hey everyone, it's John Buck. In this video, I'm going to tell you about common discrete time signals that we use over and over again as the building blocks for other signals. Uh, the four that we'll talk about in this video are the discrete time unit impulse, the discrete time unit step, exponentials, and sinusoids in discrete time. Uh, and to make a, a loose analogy, if all the signals we're going to look at this semester come from a Lego set, these are some of the most basic building blocks that we'll be using over and over again to build them, build them up by combinations of these to make other more complicated signals so that we can understand how they behave when they go through systems. Okay, so to uh, set that up, let me get my whiteboard open. Again, common discrete time signals. Uh, the most basic one is the unit impulse. The unit impulse, when we write it as equation, we'll write this as a function, we'll say it's delta of n and to define what that is, let me write it as an equation and then I'll sketch it. We say this is the function that's equal to 1 at time 0, when n equals 0, and it's equal to 0 for all the other times. And so if I were going to sketch that the way we've been drawing signals so far, this would be the signal that has amplitude 1 at the origin for n. And it would be 0 at all the other times like this. So that's the unit impulse. The unit step is another common one we'll use a lot. The unit step u of n is equal to 1 for n greater than or equal to 0 and 0 for n less than 0. So for 0 and positive time, or for negative time, maybe a better way to say this, for negative time, it's going to be 0. And then starting at 0, it takes a step up, just like the first step on a staircase, but it doesn't keep going up. So, it, so it's just a, a single step. And for all positive time, it still has height 1. Okay, so this is the unit step signal. And, and it's worth mentioning this signal continues being 1. Maybe I'll put three little dots here to indicate that it continues being 1. So it doesn't go back to 0. All the, most of the signals we've drawn become 0 outside the region we've drawn them. But this one uh, remains 1, uh, continuing to be 1 for all positive time after that. Uh, exponentials, exponential signals, are signals that take the form where x of n has the form of alpha to the n for all time. And these can behave, this is actually a broad class, it can behave uh, differently depending on the value of alpha. For example, if I have x of n is equal to, say, uh, a half to the n, it would be a very simple exponential signal, this is a signal if I sort of sketch some of this, let me try that again. That was a terrible line. Much better. So we might say this signal here, but when any, we just plug in each value of 0. When n equals 0, it will be height 1. When I go to n equals 1, well, 1 half to the 1 is a half. And then at time 2, it would be a half squared, which is one quarter. At uh, 3, n equals 3, it would be 1 eighth, and so on like that, dying down. But be careful, don't, we have to remember the negative time too. Oh, I, I, yeah, speaking of being careful, I didn't leave myself enough room. I'll do what I can here. So at n equals minus 1, it would be height 2, right? Because 1 half to the minus 1 is minus first power is 1 over 1 half, which is 2. If I kept going backwards here, I didn't really leave myself enough room at all. But I'd go up here and be 4 and then 8. So we'd see this is a signal that's dying off. And that will be true for any alpha less than uh, less than a half. Um, so before we go to sinusoids, let me mention one other thing. Let me move that out of the way, and I'll, I'll do sinusoids on the next page. Um, another important case, though, is, is a very special case we'll use a lot is the case when alpha is a complex exponential. So something like the form of e to the j omega. 
which is equal to, if I use that, if I plug that in for alpha above, I get x of n is e to the j omega n. And this is a signal that has magnitude 1, but as omega changes, it's going around and around the unit circle. Euler's identity tells me that anytime I have a complex exponential, I can write it as the cosine of the exponent plus j time plus the imaginary part is the sine of the exponent. So we will use this a lot this semester, um, particularly if I play with that properties of that a little bit, it turns out I can say, well, the cosine would be one half, if I took one half e to the j omega n and added one half e to the minus j omega n. Right, when I plug plus omega and minus omega into this description, well, cosine is even symmetric. So that cosine part would just reinforce. But sine is odd symmetric, and the imaginary parts will cancel out. Another important feature to Euler's identity is we can write sinusoids by subtracting these two exponentials. So it's 1 over 2j of e to the minus j omega n minus e to the minus j omega n. And I can pull that half actually out in front. And when I subtract the two, the real parts will cancel out. The imaginary parts, because they're odd symmetrical, reinforce, and this would work itself out. So again, these are very important identities we'll use over and over and over again due to the mathematician Euler. So we call this Euler's formula. Well, these are sort of all different flavors of Euler's formula, whether it's the exponential version or these down here. Let me add another page to talk about sinusoids. So the fourth and final kind of basic common signal we'll see a lot are sinusoids. And let me unpack these a little bit. X of n, I'm going to play with my color palette here, will be a times the cosine of omega n. And I know this seems kind of cracked to be writing these in all different colors, but there is a method to my madness, because each of these different parameters holds a different role in the signal. So a, the, or the most one we'll look at a lot, omega is the radian frequency. So this tells me the frequency of the signal. The other term inside the cosine, or it could be a sine, a sine. it doesn't actually matter if it's sine or cosine. That I mean, it matters, they look different, but these, these uh, parameters all play the same role. This is the phase shift, and then the, the piece out in front, this is the amplitude. So for example, if I have a very uh, simple sinusoid, x of n, say, is equal to uh, 2 times, uh, I'll show you, we can use sine or cosine, either one is a sinusoid, of uh, pi over 3 n. If I want to graph what that signal looks like, well, when n equals 0, sine is equal to 0, so 2 times 0 is 0. Oh, this point here should be 0. When n equals 1, I have the sine of pi over 3, uh, which is uh, root 3 over 2, and then the 2 times that would make this root 3. So that would be, let's see, root 3 is something like not quite 1 and a half. Maybe we'll call it this. So this would be root 3 at n equals 1. And then at n equals 2, this would be uh, 2 root 3, or 2 pi over 3. The sine of 2 pi over 3 is also root 3. And then when n equals 3, this is pi over 3 times 3 would be pi. So sine of pi is, again, 0. When I continue on, I'll get the, ne the signs will become negative. four, five, and then at six, I'd be back to zero again, because at six, n equals six, this is pi over three times six, which is two pi, 
which is back to being zero. If I went into negative time, I'd see the same type of thing going on. I'd see these two spikes at minus root three, at minus one and minus two. And this is all just based on plugging in and evaluating the trig signal, or the trig function at these points. So this is a chance to make your high school trig teacher proud, show what you remember about important angles. Okay, so there's an example, and it does bring up one of the important lessons. Because of the discrete time, things only existing at these discrete values, this doesn't look that much like a sinusoid like we drew in high school trig. What's going on, right, is, is it's like we're grabbing, an em we've got this underlying envelope, and we're only getting to see it at the discrete values of integers, but it so so the the window there's like this this envelope or, that we're we're just getting a few values out of, and you need some imagination, especially when the frequencies get above pi over three, pi over two, and things like that. They don't look very sinusoidal. At low frequencies, they will, because we'll have a lot of points per period, and we'll say something in another video about periodic signals. But I'll finish up here. So this is basic common discrete time signals. See you next time.